Well, good morning, Selby Pastoral Charge, and welcome to this time of worship for January 31st, 2021. Friends, the future is bright. There is something coming down the pipe that you can't even begin to imagine. Do you believe that? Is that truth true for you? The Apostle John says, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. From his fullness. Jesus doesn't do anything halfway. And when he's done with us, we too will experience his grace to the full. So to all who are feeling depleted and who are sick and tired of, of homeschooling and lockdowns, to all who mourn and feel their loss each day, to everyone who fails, and desires strength from on high. And to everyone who sins and need a savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ. So come, Christians join to sing, Alleluia, Amen. Loud praise to Christ we bring, Alleluia, Amen. Let all with heart and voice before his throne rejoice, praise in his gracious choice, Alleluia. Amen. Let's sing together. Come, Christians, join to sing. Well, today, our friend Bernice is taking me on an adventure. I'm not much of a snowshoer, but the conditions aren't great for cross-country skiing at the moment. So today, Bernice is going to take us on a tour of her daily hike over hill and dale. Today, we will enjoy the pastoral scenes of our community. We'll travel through forests, across farmers' fields, we'll hear birds and see deer tracks. And we really want to thank Ray McCutcheon for allowing us to use his his land because he's so generous with it and I just enjoy it so much every day. So as we prepare to head off in God's good creation, let's begin our time of worship by coming before him with prayer. Oh God of crisp and bright winter days, as we worship you this morning, open our hearts and minds to your possibilities. Transform us into who you are in all your beauty and loveliness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well now, here's Vince Lasher with his music ministry. Unworthy am I of the grace that he gave. Unworthy to hold to his hands. Amazed that a king would reach down to a slave. This love I cannot understand Unworthy, unworthy A beggar in bondage and alone But he made me worthy And now by his grace His mercy has made me his own my sorrow and sickness laid stripes on his back. My sins caused the blood that was shed. My faults and my failures have woven a crown of thorns that he wore on his head. Unworthy, unworthy. 
a beggar in bondage and alone, but he made me worthy, and now by his grace, his mercy has made me his own. Unworthy am I of the glory to come, unworthy with angels to sing. I thrill just to know that he loved me so much, a pauper I walk with the king. Unworthy, unworthy. A beggar in bondage and alone, but he made me worthy, and now by his grace, his mercy has made me his own. Well, now it's my time to talk directly to our young people. And today I have some funny pictures to show you. Have you ever seen pictures of people who look a lot like their pets? Like this one, and, and this one, and how about this one? And this one is my favorite. These are kind of funny, aren't they? And there have been some studies about this and, and they found that people are naturally attracted to pets that have similar features as we do. Here's something else interesting. Here's some pictures of Jesus. What do you notice about all of these pictures? Well, they're all different, aren't they? Jesus has different skin color or, or, or types of appearance because it seems that, that in every part of the world, they image Jesus to have features like ours. <laughs> but here's the thing. We don't exactly know what Jesus looked like. Of course, there was no cameras back then. But we, what we do know is that as people come to know and love Jesus, he doesn't look more like us, but we actually start to look like him. How does that happen if we don't know what he looked like? Well, we start to love in the very particular way that Jesus loved. We start to care for people that Jesus cares for. We, we start to look and act more like Jesus every day. And that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. As we learn and, and love Jesus more, people will start to experience Jesus when they experience us. And that is amazing. Let's sing together our hymn for the young at heart, Mighty to Save. Everyone needs compassion and love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of
Well, today is the final week of our New Year's sermon series called Rewired, where we're looking at how God can rewire our hearts, making us all that we can be. So here is our scripture passage for today. But I am anyone turns to the Lord. The veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and we're the Spirit of the Lord. There is freedom. And we all in veiled faces come to meet the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image and ever increasing glory comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the Word of the Lord. <laughs> well, now let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come so that we might hear what you have for us today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. My family used to enjoy watching the reality TV show called Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Each week, the show's host, Ty, and his team would choose a worthy family and totally redesign their home to suit their needs. Each episode came to a conclusion with the family surrounded by the designers, the builders, and the volunteers awaiting the big reveal of their new home. There would always be a bus blocking the view, and then everyone would shout, Bus driver, move that bus! And it would pull away, revealing the incredibly renewed and rebuilt home. There would be shock and joy and tears as the family found themselves bewildered by the changes that have taken place over the course of just a few days. You could just see these people overcome by their emotions, having received such a, a tremendous gift that they have never earned or, or, and could never repay. And there's something about this vision of transformation that excites us. As the family tours their new home, we trail along and celebrate with them as they and, and as we imagine how different their lives will be living in these new and renewed spaces. And in a way, this is what happens in the Christian life. The Christian life is one captivated by a glorious vision of new possibilities, of life renewed day by day. Now, two weeks ago, we talked about how Christians begin this transformation. We must recognize that in order to change our actions, we need to change our affections. And then last week, we saw how Jesus is the ultimate affection, who meets our deepest needs most completely. So today, we're going to wrap up this series by taking a step back and looking at how, the, at how this new affection also gives us a vision for what we are becoming. So what are we becoming? Well, simply more like Jesus. But this is where the gospel vision will put us in conflict with the cultural vision of the good life. Because our culture tells us that in order to be truly happy, we need to dig deep within ourselves and satisfy our own hearts and wants and desires. But you see, that this vision for our lives, while it sounds liberating and freeing, is actually a real burden because it puts a, a real pressure on us to live up to our full potential, to accomplish everything on our bucket list and to be all that you can be under your own steam. And ultimately, it is that pressure that leads us to sin. There are two kinds of sin that result from our do-it-yourself salvation. The first kind of sin is caused by trying so hard that we end up taking what isn't ours, reaching beyond our capacity, clawing our way to the top. Along the way, we, we hurt, steal, and shove our way to success. And that's how we end up with a world divided, untrusting, and angry. The second kind of sin is caused by shooting too low. <laughs> we, because let's be honest, most of us are, are pretty satisfied as we are. We're okay with covering up our blemishes and, and finding easy solutions to our, over, uh, to our shortcomings. If we're honest, most of us don't really want complete transformation. That sounds messy and hard. And so we live below our potential without fully using the gifts that God has given us. But that's why the Christian vision is so much more liberating. This morning, Paul says, 
But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Why freedom? Because the problem of transforming ourselves becomes God's work. We no longer need to invent ourselves from scratch. We no longer need to take what isn't ours to, to get where we're going. We don't need to try to cover up our blemishes to avoid the harder work of transformation because it becomes God's work. So what is God setting out to do in you and me? Well, not to craft you into a more unique version of yourself, but to make you more like Jesus. Paul says, and we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. You see, we may be satisfied with things as they are. Sure, we, we know there's a few spots that need our attention, but well, well, we'll get around to that eventually. But God has bigger plans for you. God is fitting you for heaven. But how is he going to do that? Well, do you remember a couple of weeks ago I talked about the sin process? Where does sin come from? It comes from temptation. And, and where does temptation come from? It comes from our desires, our, our unfulfilled wants. Where do our wants come from? Well, they come from our belief that God will not give us what we need. So sin, at its root, comes from a lack of faith. But what happens if we turn this process around and we put belief or faith first? What happens when we believe that God will meet us in our challenges? What happens when we trust that God will give us what we really need? What happens when we believe that God is at work in us? Well then, instead of letting our unmet wants and desires drive our actions, our faith drives our actions. Because if we have the conviction that God is good and will provide, our desires start to look different. We will still have desires, but our desires will drive us to God and not to fulfill our own wants. We will anticipate that God already has a solution for us. It may not be what we think it is. In fact, it probably isn't what we think it will be. But we can anticipate that out of our faith, God will give us opportunities. These could be opportunities for service, opportunities for love, opportunities to give ourselves away, or opportunities to meet him in our wants. But we can be sure of one thing. These opportunities are where we will find God. Jesus will show up one way or another. So now, instead of letting our unmet desires lead us to sin, our unmet desires lead us to God, knowing that he will meet our deepest wants. So out of our deepest affection and trust in God, the Holy Spirit rewires our whole thinking, causing us to change our actions. I recently began watching the BBC version of Les Miserables on CBC. It's such a compelling story which has been told and retold over the years. And I think that this production captures our imaginations because it so powerfully illustrates what we're talking about today. In the story, the main character, Jean Valjean, has just been released from prison. But at every turn, he is denied fair wages and opportunities because he carries the passport of a parolee. He's led into a life of sin and despair as a result of his lack of options. Well, one night, while Valjean sleeps outside in the cold, a woman discovers him and suggests that he find shelter with the local priest who welcomes him into his home and offers him food and, and a warm bed. However, Valjean doesn't trust that God will meet his needs. And so, he takes advantage of the priest and steals his silver communion set. Later, Valjean is caught by the local authorities and brought back to the priest's home. But instead of, the, uh, of charging Valjean as he deserved, the priest explains to the authorities that he gave Valjean the silver and even adds the most valuable candlesticks to the bounty. The priest later tells Valjean that he did this because he has bought his soul for God through this gesture of undeserved kindness. Well, it was this act of love that ultimately transformed Valjean's heart because it was grace, the true love of God, that affected his heart and transformed him through and through. The same is true for us. We cannot beat sin by addressing sin directly. 
we must defeat sin by responding to the grace that we have been given by Jesus Christ. Only the gospel has the power to transform our affections and rewire our hearts. That's what this sermon series has been all about. In order to change an action, we need to change an affection. And Jesus Christ is the only affection that can meet our needs fully. And once we learn that God can and will meet our needs, real transformation becomes possible because we're set free to love wastefully, knowing that through our love, we will encounter Jesus, our source, our source of power, our source of wisdom, our source of all things. But here's the problem for people like us. We look at people like Jean Valjean and say, well, he definitely needed some transformation. But luckily, I'm not like that. I'm already pretty nice. Sure, I'm not perfect, but overall, I'm good enough. And here's where we demonstrate that we don't really understand what God is doing. C.S. Lewis, in his final chapter of his book, Mere Christianity, explains it better than I ever could. He says, niceness, wholesomeness is an excellent thing. We must try by every medical, educational, economic, and political means in our power to produce a world where men, as many people as possible grow up nice, just as we must try to produce a world where all have plenty to eat. But we must not suppose that even if we succeed, we should have saved their souls. Because a world of nice people, content in their own niceness, looking no further, turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world, and it might even be more difficult to save. He says, for mere improvement is not redemption, though redemption always improves people even here and now, and will in the end improve them to a degree we cannot yet imagine. But, he says, God became man to turn creatures into sons, not simply to produce nice people of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of person. It's not like teaching a horse to jump better and better, but like teaching a horse to become a unicorn. Of course, once it has got its wings, it will soar over fences that it never could have been jumped before, and thus beat the natural horse at his own game. Lewis concludes with these poignant words. Look to yourself, and in the long run, only loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay but look to Christ, and you will find him, and with him everything else is thrown in. How true is that? When our hearts are set on Christ, transformation, life to its full, is the natural outcome. Transformation, not because we went after it and, and took it for ourselves, and not by lowering our standards and being satisfied with how we are, but transformation because God is fitting us for heaven. And so we must keep the, the big reveal before us as we run the race of life. God has big plans for you, and they start with a rewiring of your heart. Plans that will lead us to life abundant and life eternal. And it all begins with faith. And it ends with perfection. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now
Freely we have received and freely we give. It's now time for our offering. And if you would like to send your offering this morning, you can do so by mail, by e-transfer, or by joining our automatic banking option called PAR. The details for the first two options are on your screen now. And so I offer this simple blessing over all the gifts that we have received to God's service. These are the work of our hands and the love of our hearts. May they be a blessing to this community and the wider world, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now it's time for our, for our prayer of the people. And we are so glad that uh, Bernice is willing to lead us in prayer this morning. Here's Bernice. Let us pray. Dear God, we are thankful for the beauty of your world and for life itself. Even locked down in our homes, we can know the joy of fellowship with our Creator. Sometimes a slower pace helps us focus better on what really matters. Thank you. We are grateful that we know who to say thank you to. Our world is in need of you, and we know you want to use us to make the world a better place. We ask for your hand of help in so many situations of distress in our world. Lord, people we love are hurting and need your healing touch. We are so glad you love them too and far more than we ever could. We place these people in your hands again today. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Amen. And now we'll sing to God be the glory. Jesus the Son and 
Well, I am just so glad that you could join us again this morning. And we go out in the hope of life renewed day by day. A very special thanks to Ray and Amy for allowing us to use this beautiful property for today's service. And thanks to Bernice for being my guide. Next week, we're starting a new sermon series called Gospel Culture, where we will be exploring how Jesus not only transforms our individual hearts, but he also transforms our culture. So until next week, go with God's blessing. Be strong and of good courage, and do not be afraid, for it is the Lord who goes with you. Go and join Christ in the world, healing and speaking words of grace and witnessing to the sacred in our everyday. Go now in peace. Amen.